doctors said that there was nothing else they could do to help my sight, and they said that I would eventually become blind. AT&T and Ira present the Hashtag Experience More campaign showcasing Paralympian world record holder Lex Gillette. You know, just think of what is possible when I go out into the world and take that same energy and, and mindset, really focusing on a specific area, taking aim and knocking it down. AT&T Experience More is an innovative social project that celebrates how blind individuals experience more through their actions, passions, use of technology, and more. You continue to do what you need to do and go towards that vision of what you see, then eventually it'll come into their visual field as well. You know, just really go out there and turn that vision into reality. Ira, the virtual navigator for the blind, instant access to information and you can learn more and subscribe to ira on the web at aira.io you can find out more about hashtag experience more on the web at experience more.att.com when i broke the world record i overslept i showed up to the track late i only had maybe like 30 40 minutes to get ready Welcome to Blind Abilities. I'm Jeff Thompson. And I'm Pete Lane. Our guest today is Lex Gillette. The name Lex Gillette. That has world champion written all over it. Lex is a multi-talented individual. Let's see if we can get all of his accomplishments right. Lex is a four-time Paralympian. Four-time world champion. A world record holder. He's also been showcased on TED Talks with a very inspirational speech. A singer and so much more. Lex, welcome to Blind Abilities. It's great to have you aboard. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Lex, let's kick it off back in your childhood. Talk a little bit about your background, your blindness, how it affected you in school and what you did to overcome it. Yes, so I am, I'm originally from Raleigh, North Carolina. I was born with sight. So I've been able to you know, see the world. And I can remember one particular day I had come home from school. I was seven years old and went through my regular routine, had played outside with friends, had eaten dinner with my mom. And that night as I was in the bathroom getting cleaned up for bed, I started noticing that the lights in the bathroom, they were they were kind of blurred. So I rubbed my eyes thinking that, you know, maybe this is going to clear up, but it didn't it didn't clear any. So I got out of the tub and I knew something was wrong immediately once I had looked into the mirror and the reflection that that I thought I would see was it was kind of like a, a distorted figure, like very faint. And that was pretty alarming to me. I told my mom and, and she thought maybe I had gotten something in my eyes. So we got some water, cleaned my eyes out, made it feel better, but it didn't clear my sight any. So I went to bed thinking that in the morning everything would be okay. When I woke up, nothing had had really changed. I went to school. Halfway through the school day, teachers called my mom and said that, you know, we need you to come get Lex because we don't know what's going on. He's acting out of character. And I had went to school thinking that maybe this was just something that was going to you know blow over. But I was unsuccessful in, in getting through that day. So my mom had taken me to the doctor. And after an examination, they said I needed to have an emergency operation because I was suffering from retina detachments. I had one operation and it was successful. I could see well for about three or four weeks. After that time, the same problem happened again. My retinas detached. So that was the pattern for the entire time that I was eight years old. I've had a total of 13 operations on my eyes, of which 10 of them occurred the year when I was eight. After the last one, doctors said that there was nothing else they could do to help my sight. And they said that I would eventually become blind. Yeah, those aren't the words you really want to hear, especially at your age when that happened. I know that was, it was really difficult time. You know, at that age, I think the first thing that I really thought was, hey, I'm not going to be able to play my video games anymore. I'm not going to be able to play outside with my friends. And when that day finally came, when, you know, I woke up and I couldn't really, I couldn't really make out anything anymore. It was, it was reality. And that, that started that, that journey for me of living life without being able to, to see. And of course I had to make that adjustment and 
as a kid in school, I had to learn how to read Braille. I had to learn how to use a cane so I can navigate on my own. I had to learn how to use accessible technology so that I would be able to do my classwork and do my homework. And my mom kept me in mainstream school. So, you know, I've always interacted with my sighted peers in class. You know, it was it was a it was a great time once I actually you know, got a hold of living life without without sight. So, Lex, you started to accept your blindness. But at what point was it that you started to accept the challenges that you put upon yourself that was probably what other people didn't expect for you to do or even yourself not to do? For example, the basketball net that you bought. I would say probably around like those preteen years, maybe 11, 12 years old, about two years, three years in of not being able to see. I was blind and, you know, I was trying to just figure out life, you know, and, and my, my mom always encouraged me to try many different things. She always pushed me to, to the max. And, you know, I've I've always had that mentality. I I love challenges and I love trying to excel and ascend to new heights. For me, what you're referring to is, yeah, I went to the store and I had bought a you know, one of the plastic basketball rims that are designed for the top of a closet door. And so I, I've always loved sports. My mom's side of the family, everyone, you know, they're pretty athletic. They played everything from baseball, softball to basketball, volleyball, just, just everything. And that has you know been something that is a big part of my life and you know i wanted to be athletic as well so i had bought this basketball rim and figured that i would be able to you know shoot baskets and make it the only problem was i had to figure out a method that would inform me when the ball would actually go into the net because i could shoot all day but i would never know if it actually went in so i took a safety pin and i tied the bottom of the net together so now when i would shoot the ball if it was a successful basket the ball would stay inside of the net instead of falling through to the ground so that was kind of the basis around my ted talk that i did last year and and that was taking shots in the dark literally and figuratively because once i figured out that if I envisioned where that rim was, you know, I found out that I could I could drain the shot all day long. I could stand anywhere in my room, shoot the ball, make it. You know, it will go into the net. You know, I just felt like, you know, if I have the ability to tap into this power within me inside the home, then, you know, just think of what is possible when I go out into the world and take that same energy and, and mindset, you know, just really focusing on a specific area, taking aim and knocking it down, and making that shot count. What types of accommodations did they make to enable you to get through that kind of ordeal? They had all of the schools that I went to, they had a uh, teacher of the visually impaired that would... I think, well, the schools that I attended, there was an actual visually impaired program that was a part of, you know, it was a separate department within the school. So even though I was in mainstream, we had about all of the schools I attended, we had about maybe five to 10 blind or visually impaired kids in, in the school. So you know, that that department, the visually impaired department, did wonders for us, um, being able to get our assignments in Braille, put our assignments in large print so that we could still interact and be a part of, of our classroom environment. And for me, I would I would go to you know, the VI room and, and get my assignments in Braille. They had all of my textbooks in Braille. They had the Brailleists, so all of the worksheets and uh, physical sheets of paper that teachers would hand out. I could take those to the Braille list and they would you know, type those up or scan them in and, and have those printed out in Braille as well. So all of my assignments were made available in a format that I could use so that I could, I could participate in class alongside my peers. Oh, that's great, Lex. So is that when you met up with your coach slash teacher that got you interested in track and field? 
Yes. So the head of our VI program, he was a, an assistant basketball coach for the high school. He also would go with us to PE class. It was my freshman year. We had to go through this physical fitness test where you would do as many push-ups as you could, as many pull-ups as you could, sit-ups. And one of the events was standing long jump. I was really good at, at standing long jump. In fact, I could stand in one location and I could jump nearly 10 feet. And being in mainstream school you know everyone else can see and, and that was exciting to them like oh my gosh like this is, like he's he's blind like he's jumping like further than we are <laughs> my at that point my teacher slash eventual coach had taught me about the running long jump he told me about the Paralympic Games and being able to potentially travel the world and win medals and represent the United States of America and that vision was so glaring to me and it, it became something that I wanted to pursue. You use the words vision and sight quite differently. Can you explain that? Yeah, so I've done a lot of reading and I think that a lot of it revolves around sight showing us what is, you know, that's that's what you see. It's a function of the eyes. You know, vision reveals what can be. That's your mind. That's your heart. They are two totally different things. And, you know, sight, it can only carry you, but so far a vision can carry you to the end of time. You know, myself, when I roll out of the bed each morning, that's that vision that really keeps me going. You know, thinking about winning gold in 2020 or thinking about what I want my life to look like 15, 20 years down the road and how I want to impact the world. That's what really keeps that fire lit internally excellent so lex you excelled at the standing broad jump and you saw potential how did you transition into sports in high school did you participate in mainstream sports yes so the first step was my coach his name is Brian Whitmer. And so Coach Whitmer had taken me to a sports education camp in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And that camp was under the umbrella of the United States Association of Blind Athletes, USABA. And during this camp, you would learn about all of the Paralympic sports and they would encourage you to try them all. And at the end of the week, you would participate against other athletes, other individuals who attended the camp in like, you know, friendly competition. And up there, that's where I found out about running long jump. And that's where Coach Whitmer had taught me about the process by which we would even compete in long jump. And what that is, is the athlete who is blind stands on the track and they run to the sound of someone who's standing at the takeoff point or the takeoff board. And the sighted guide or your long jump caller, they're clapping and yelling. So that gives you that audible reference as to where you need to run and jump from. And he yelled, fly, 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 And your responsibility as the athlete is to remember how many strides you take running straight as possible towards that sound. And once you get to the appropriate step, then you jump. And I always tell people, when I, when I jump, I just pray to God I'm going to land in the sand pit. <laughs> it, it was there where I found out that I, you know, I, I did have a love for the sport. And we returned back to Raleigh, North Carolina, and I joined my high school track team my junior year and my senior year. So as you can imagine, I'm on the team. I'm the only blind kid on the team and probably the only one in our conference. There were definitely some interesting moments with going to rival schools and, you know, kids asking, oh, like, well, what are you doing here? Like, what do you mean? Like, I'm, I came here to compete. I came here to beat you. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. You know, it definitely helped build that grit. And, you know, it, in a lot of ways, it helped thicken my skin as well. Did you beat him? You know what? I, I did. I had my fair share of, of wins. Um, I remember one in particular. I had went to, we had went somewhere, one of our competitions. And before we get out there and compete, you know, the kids are like, oh, man, like you jump, you're jumping, you're jumping. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Kids, they're, they're asking, oh, so how far do you jump? They're trying to, you know, they're trying to size you up. I would intentionally tell them something super short, like, oh, you know, I only jump like, 13 or 14 feet just so they, <laughs> they you you don't have to worry about me i'm just a, i'm just a blind kid and once we actually would get on the track um and start competing then you know i would jump and you know, I'm, I'm going like 17 or 18 feet and you know that's 
you know, you're, you're flying. The, uh, yeah, exactly. So yeah, as you can imagine, some of their voices turn from you know excitement to just total defeat. So I, I, I have to admit, in a lot of ways, it was it was very satisfying <laughs> to be able to go out there and, and get those wins. Do you remember what your high school best was? My best in high school was 19 feet, 9 inches, I believe. That was good. It helped boost my confidence a lot. I am curious, Lex, did they give you any leeway or concession if you missed the board, if you step, you know, an inch or two over the board? No, so that's the 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 rule is once you step over the board, it's considered a foul. They wouldn't give me any leeway on that, which I mean that that also helped out as well too. You know, you, you got to follow the rules and you have to put yourself in the in the best position. That means you have to train hard and that served you much later, didn't it? Yes, yes. So, at what point did you bridge from high school into college, and how did you end up headed towards the Paralympics? My senior year, I had gotten pretty good in track and field, and the that very next year was the Athens Games. That was something that was on my radar. There was a World Championships in 2002. I had just missed out on the standard for that, so I didn't go to that competition. So then I had turned my attention to Athens in 2004. Coach Whitmer and I, we continued to work and train, and you know he got me to the point where I was able to make the games team in 2004. I was going into my sophomore year at East Carolina University, so as you can imagine, that was... I I just finished my freshman year and that summer I was going to Athens and I felt good. You know, I had my first year of college under my belt, but at the same time, the games were in September. So that meant I was going to miss the first like that month and a half of school. That was a really tough time for me trying to balance the, the athletic piece and the academic piece. But it was really important to me. You know, from an academic standpoint, I had to go to my professors and make sure that I would be able to get those assignments and, and be able to follow along so that once I returned, I wouldn't be too far behind. Going to that first games was, that was crazy. You know, in a lot of ways, you know, I had just gone from high school to college and in a lot of ways, it was the same way athletically. I had, I had just gone from, you know, competing in conference meets in high school to, to the games. And, and it was just a, a, a huge jump and a huge transition. And I'll never forget standing on the track in Athens in front of thousands and thousands of spectators and everybody's cheering. There's so much chaos, so much, so many noises and and it's just, it's crazy inside of there. And at that time, you know, you, you come to the realization, it's like, man, you know, going back to that basketball room and, and, and taking that shot in the dark, it's like, you, know, you, you take that shot and you realize that, man, you know, I, I nailed it. Now, you said your mom was a big advocate for you. What was it like for her that you were in, in Greece there? Oh, it was amazing. My mom was actually in the crowd. My grandmother was in the crowd. Coach Whitmer and his wife were in the crowd. The very people who engineered that success, I was so glad that they were there because you know they invested so much time into me and they they helped me out so much. Those days where you know I felt like that you know I couldn't do it or you know, I was just hard on myself or I needed you know, that little push, you know, they were there. And for them to see that vision unravel in front of their own eyes, you know, I think that absolutely meant the world to them. Lex, going back to after your 2004 experience, from then on, it was world games, world competition, the game was on. Yes. From there, I was fully engulfed in college and I was definitely trying to make sure I satisfied that piece. Not only because I'm, you know, academics definitely important. I knew that the athletic life at some point that's going to have to come to an end. You know, you can't be an athlete forever or at least a, a, an elite level athlete forever. And I also knew that you know, my mom, you know, if I didn't get good grades, my mom would have had my head. College was going great and Pan American Games and, and you know, all of these competitions, they started coming one after another. And, and it became something that you know, I would look to these things and, you know, mentally prepare and, and physically prepare on the basis of, you know, going out there and getting on the podium and, you know, being able to travel to all of these places and win medals and wear that red, white, and blue and have the, have the flag on my chest. That was amazing. And it still is amazing at this particular time. But again, it just all goes back to that seed that Coach Whitmer planted into my mind at an early age. And, and he talked about all of those things and I began to, to live out that vision. 
So Lex, with all the experience you had with the sports and you're still going to the 2020, you're looking forward to that. What was the one moment that you remember the best? One of my most memorable moments was we were in London. I was on the track and London, just to give you an idea, they, you know, they're huge into track and field. They hear about a track and field competition and they're going to pack out the stadium. Mind you, it was a game. So of, of course it would be packed anyway. They make you feel at home. The facilities were great. The culture is great. Food was pretty good. The weather was good. And we were in a country where you know, they speak English. So you know, I, I was going to be able to understand everything. It's not like going to, to Beijing or Brazil or you know Spain. But I remember standing on the track and I was getting ready for one of my final jumps. I was trying to get myself pumped up. So I'm you know, I started clapping my hands in this in a rhythm. And the next thing I know, all 80, 85,000 people in the stand started clapping their hands the exact rhythm as I was clapping mine. And I mean, it just gives you chills in your wow. body and, and just that that unity. And you know, they just it, it was awesome. That's all I can say. It was it was it was something I'll never, ever forget. You talked about the TED talk earlier. How did that come about? The TED Talk came about, I want to say a few years ago, I, you know, I started speaking more and I told myself that I want to I want to have some more opportunities to speak and not being in front of people and necessarily telling my story as a like an autobiographical type of speech, but more so using the story to ignite something within others. And so I said, I need to find out you know, how, how can I do this? And, you know, someone was telling me that, oh, well, you, know, you should try to do a you know a TED Talk. OK, well, all right. But I didn't know how I was going to pull that off. Fortunately, one of my friends had uh, like a connection to TEDx San Diego, which was, you know, of course, here in San Diego where I, where I train. I went and talked to the gentleman and just to find out about the the organization and when they were having the next event. And it just so happened that the TED speech was going to be in October and they had one more spot for the event. And so they're asking me also, oh, if we gave you the theme, the age of magic, I believe, you know, how would you you know, formulate a speech around that theme for the event. And so that's when I, I, you know, really just started spilling out like, hey, it's such a magical experience when, A, when you have that vision and, and when you really can tap into that ability to take that shot in the dark. And when you gain the, the type of confidence where, like, when you throw up, you're going to make the mark. I mean, it's such a, a magical experience when, when that happens and everything starts to unravel the way you sort of envision it. In a lot of ways, I felt like that was a, like an interview for me. And so they told me that, hey, we want you to take the last spot for, for the show. And um, from there, you know, it was just a long process of you know, trying to you know, get everything the way I wanted and, you know, get my thoughts down, make an outline. And at the same time, I was training for Brazil. So I, I, it was a lot going on and I had to really you know, buckle down and get it all together. You did a fantastic job, and we'll have a link to that TED Talk in our show notes. It's very inspiring and really great presentation, Lex. So your your notoriety and achievements in sports has offered you a unique platform from which you can provide help to other people and other individuals. Talk a little bit about your advocacy efforts for starters, maybe start off with Classroom Champions? Yes. So Classroom Champions is an organization that pairs Olympians and Paralympians to students who are in underserved schools across the United States and Canada. I'm a mentor, and this year I have five classrooms, and this is all done virtually. So we send video lessons each month to our classrooms via the Google community, and that lesson may range from goal setting to diversity, teamwork, community, perseverance. So each month is dedicated to a specific skill. We teach the kids in that video what that skill is, how we incorporate it into our lives as athletes or you know, just individually. And then at the end of each video, we give the kids a challenge so they can implement that skill into their own lives. The kids will then send a video back or maybe they'll make a PowerPoint or write essays 
you know, let you know this is what I did to implement goal setting. This, these are the long term and short term goals that I have, and this is how I'm going to achieve them. So you really get an opportunity to you know, see the kids working, see their minds working and, and see them you know, going out and trying to incorporate these things into their lives. It lasts for the entire year. So you work with them from the beginning of school until the end of that school year. So you really start to develop a bond with these kids. And although we do exchange videos each month, we do have a live session, a live uh, video call with them during the fall and during the spring. And for me, I've told the the team from Classroom Champions, like, hey, if at all possible, you know, I, I have to visit my kids in person. You know, it's something like you, you can't help but to want to go be with them in person after building such a strong bond and strong relationship with them. Um, so for the past, I've been in the, the program for four years now. And I want to say I've, I've visited the majority of my classrooms. I will say they do have a contest. Classroom Champions does have a contest at the end of the year where they they pull names and there's a um, there's a sponsor who will sponsor athletes visits to go see their classrooms. But of course, you have to be one of the lucky ones that wins that drawing. But since I travel a lot for either competition or speeches, if I am in the vicinity of my classrooms within that year that we're working together, I'll try to to hit classroom champions up and say, hey, I'm going to be in the area. Let's see if we can make this happen so I can go hang out with the kids for a little bit and again, have that in-person interaction instead of it just being videos and, and uh, live chats. That's really cool. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I also want to talk about, so then you also have... Um, um, there's a company called Ira, and Ira is a company who gives the blind and visually impaired the ability to, you know, explore the world and, and experience life in a different way. Ira uses the the smart glass technology to give access to information for those who are blind and visually impaired. And then you have an agent, which is a human being in a remote area, and they have a dashboard on their computer. And when you link up up your smart glass to the app on your phone that gives the agent the ability to you know see where you are in real time i could talk to an agent and say hey you know, i'm 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 ran out of groceries i need to go to a grocery store and pick up a few things so you would log in they would track your route from your home to the store and they will give you audible directions as to where you need to you know, walk. So if you're on Jones Street, for example, and they're saying, hey, continue walking straight. You're coming up to 31st. I need you to make a left hand turn. OK, there's a fire hydrant to your right hand side. So make sure that you, know, you step to the left a little bit. You continue to walk. OK, I see someone that's coming up on your left hand side. Maybe you should stay a little bit to your right. And so they're giving you all of these directions and as soon as you walk into the store they're with you as well and they're telling you okay you want fruit loops okay all right let's go to aisle four okay i I see the cereal. Okay, keep walking straight. And the cool thing about Ira is they can take screenshots of what you would be seeing if you could see. If you are in a grocery store and there's so many different options on the shelf, they'll ask you to step back. They'll take a screenshot so they can sit there and sift through all of the options. And then they're able to say, okay, I see the Fruit Loops. They're on the fourth shelf from the from the floor. All right, I'll reach to the right, reach to the right. Okay, boom, that box right there. You grab that one. Those are the Fruit Loops, and it's really crazy. I I actually learned about Ira through TEDx San Diego because they have this thing called Innovation Alley. And Innovation Alley goes on for the duration of the TED program in Southside. So as people are going in and out, they're able to go down Innovation Alley and see some of the really cool startups that are going on. And Ira is located in La Jolla, California, which is just to the north of San Diego. And that's where I was introduced to them. And it was really awesome. They're very uh, just forward thinking. And I think it's really you know helping the blind to to gain that much more independence instant access to information it is a wonderful technology in fact this podcast is brought to you by at&t the at&t experience more campaign and ira so fruit loops is a new breakfast of champions huh you, you know what i, I can't <laughs> even lie i am i i, I love cereal i don't eat I wouldn't say I eat all of the sugary ones as 
as much as I used to. But every once in a while, you have to and you you gotta you gotta splurge a little bit just to <laughs> make yourself feel good. Even when you're in training, come on, man, you're in training. <laughs> you know what? But the thing is, when you're satisfying yourself, that enables you to go out there and train that much harder. Oh yeah. I will tell you this. So we were in Rio. You know, a lot of the athletes realized that the food that we were getting served in in the athletes' village, it, it, you know, it could have it could have been better. So it's just like when you, when you're not getting satisfied, when your appetite just isn't like a hundred percent satisfied, it just puts you in a, a bad mood. That's that term, hangry. Mm. You know, you find it, it's like, man, I got to get some good food because this just isn't, I, I just don't feel right. And so as soon as you, you know, you get that good piece of chicken or that, that good bowl of Fruit Loops or, you know, whatever it is. Comfort food, right? I, yeah. You got exactly. it. Lex, you made a comment on one of your films that I was watching and it really stuck with me. You said that while you're in the games and you're participating at the Olympics and stuff that, you know, your blindness, that's not part of it. Yeah, I like to think of it as, you know, when my, so growing up in the environment that I did, you know, my mom, my teacher slash coach, you know, they gave me access to so many resources, so much information that it got to the point where they made me forget that I was blind. And I say that because I had so many other things to worry about. I, I had no time to think about not being able to see. I, I, I needed to get through school. I needed to to train. I needed to lift weights. I needed to do all of these things that would help me become an independent individual in the world. And I was so focused on those things that the blindness, it just didn't even matter anymore. Like this has nothing to do with whether or not I will succeed. It's all about you know, having access to these opportunities. And again, just circling back to having that vision and seeing something that isn't quite in existence, yet knowing that you have the ability to set those goals and work hard to bring whatever that vision is into fruition. So Lex, what advice would you give to someone who's in high school today, transitioning to college, to the workplace or into sports? What advice would you have for them? Uh, I would say at that age, I was just trying to learn as much as possible, you know, reading as much as possible, talking to people, just learning as much as you can, because I feel like what that does is the more that you learn and the more that you're exposed to, that allows you to expand your reach. And when, you, when you're able to have all of that knowledge and to have all of those resources available to you, it increases your opportunities. And I think it points to a phrase I like to say that the further that you can see, the more you can be. I, I can't express how important it is to you know really just go out there and just to try different things. And you know sometimes it's going to be, you're going to feel a little uncomfortable, but the one thing that I do know is that when you have those moments where you feel a little discomfort or, or you know, things are out of your comfort zone, you know, you're on the cusp of something amazing when you have those moments because you're really expanding your, your reach. Well said. Lex, you're a singer. I've heard a couple of instances on your videos where you have done a little bit of singing. How's that going for you? Are you considering that maybe as an alternate profession? <laughs> yes, the singing. So I, I wouldn't say I wanted to be a singer as a profession solely. But what I do want to do is I want to record some albums. I want to kind of fuse the singing piece into some of my speeches. Of course, you know, I sing a little bit in the TED Talk and I'm, I'm singing in other speeches, but really just trying to utilize that that musical aspect to kind of reinforce some of the some of the points that I talk about in my speeches. Yeah, if it does spiral off into something that's a little bigger, then you know, I wouldn't steer away from that. But you'll knock them out at the Olympic Village karaoke. <laughs> exactly. I could have like a have a put on a little concert for the whole athletes village. There you go. Well Lex, we have an audience that's dying to hear some music. You got a little ditty for us here to close us out? Uh, you know what? I mean, of course, being an athlete, I'm I'm always uh, <clears throat> let's see. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars. Through the perilous fight, 
or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets regular the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there Oh, say does that star spangled banner yet wave O'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Lex Gillette with Yay. our national anthem. Outstanding. Good job. Good job. That's a first on Blind Abilities. I appreciate it. Lex, I have a question for you. What was the feeling when you achieved the world record? When I broke the world record, I will tell you I I overslept. I showed up to the track late. I only had, I'm not even sure, maybe like 30, 40 minutes to get ready for the competition. And usually I arrived to the track probably like a, an hour and a half before. So I was already in a, in a bad spot. Um, I had to rush. You know, go through a, a, a quicker warm up routine than normal. And I just remember being on the track and I felt really just like I was relaxed. I was more relaxed than normal. So when I ran and I jumped and I landed the mark and they said what it was, I was like, what do you mean? Like that really just happened right now. But I think one of the things that my, my current coach talks about now is, you know, staying relaxed. And you know, having that physical exertion and, and trying hard, but at the same time, you know, being relaxed. And the one thing that I remember is that I, I felt like I was moving pretty good, but it just felt like it was really seamless and it was very easy. And I will tell you, I've been trying to match that feeling for the longest. I, I actually tied the world record again in 2015 and it was the same thing. It felt like everything had slowed down mentally. I was able to really feel every aspect of the run every aspect of the jump and when i landed i don't know what it is but i'm still trying to tap into that that realm so i can find it again because i know i have some more world records inside of me and what was that mark that mark is uh 6.73 meters that's 22 feet one inch 22 feet one inch fly 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 and hit the mark on your 16th step yeah that's it lex is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners uh, you know what? Uh, I mean, I think we, we've we hit on it the entire time. I mean, you really do have something inside of you. You have what it takes. And I think that is seeing it within yourself and having the courage to step out there, put yourself out there, try new things, learn as much as possible so that you can expand your reach. And I always like to say as well, sometimes you're, you're going to have moments where you see things within yourself and maybe people looking from the outside in, they're just like, oh, are you sure you want to do this? Like, you know, they may, they may question what your dreams and aspirations are, but you, know, you stay confident and grounded in what you believe and what you see. You set those goals, you work hard to bring that into fruition. And they may not see at this particular time, but if you continue to do what you need to do and go towards that vision of what you're seeing, of what you're seeing, then eventually it'll come into their visual field as well. You know, just really go out there and turn that vision into reality. That's very well put. It was really nice talking to you, Lex, and hearing your story. And, you know, you're true to yourself. You're true to what you you believe in, your vision, and you set your sights on it and you go for it. Good for you and good luck in 2020 in Tokyo. Right on. <laughs> Thanks, guys. We've been speaking with Lex Gillette, Paralympian, world champion, world record holder, TED Talker, outstanding singer, and inspirational and motivational speaker. And thanks so much, Lex, for inspiring us today. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much and goodbye from Blind Abilities. One take Jake. That's what they call me around here. One take Jake. One take Jake. One take Jake. One take Jake. <laughs> Pete and I really enjoy talking to Lex Gillette. He's bringing so much awareness to blindness and doing so much for the Paralympic sports, helping those in less fortunate situations with his community service. Lex Gillette, thank you for coming on the Blind Abilities and thank you very much for what you're doing to make this place a better world. Thank you. And thank you very much, AT&T, for your hashtag, Experience More Campaign. 
and helping bring awareness to the possibilities. And Ira, the virtual navigator for the blind. Instant access to information. You can find more information about the Experience More campaign at experiencemore.att.com. And you can sign up and subscribe to Ira on the web at aira.io. Ira. And as always, thank you, Chichao, for your beautiful music. That's Il Chichao on Twitter. Thanks, Chichao. When I think of having courage, this quote comes to mind. For those determined to fly, having no wings is just a little detail. I'm asking you to take a shot in the dark, to fly. And this song by the Beatles illustrates my shot, my flight. Blackbirds singing in the dead of night. Take these broken wings and learn to fly All this time You were only waiting for this moment to arise Blackbird singing in the dead of night Take these sunken eyes and learn to see all this time You were only waiting for this moment to be free Blackbird fly Blackbird fly Into the light Of the dark black night This has been a Blind Abilities production. We hope you enjoyed, and until next time, bye-bye. When we share what we see through through each each other's other's eyes, eyes, we can then then begin begin to bridge bridge the gap between between the the limited expectations and the reality reality of blind abilities. abilities. For more podcasts with a blindness perspective, check us out on the web at www.blindabilities.com. On Twitter at BlindAbilities. Download our app from the App Store, BlindAbilities, that's two words. Or send us an email at info at blindabilities.com. Thanks for listening.